course. Today is our third session. And after the session, I'll be sending you the broad outline of what we will be covering in the 51 sessions. Each session will be based on one question that addresses a question that addresses both the philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita as well as uh, some contemporary need or concern that we all have in our lives. And so today's session we'll be discussing about uh, what is death, what is reincarnation, and do we have soulmates? And basically, these are three topics we will cover. And uh, here, this is the slideshow. These three topics I'm going to cover today. And each topic, so we will be discussing based on a verse from the Bhagavad Gita. Each topic. So today I'm discussing from 222 in the Bhagavad Gita. So 222 is So Vasam Sijirani. That the body is like a the body is like a cloth and the soul is like the wearer of that cloth. And Vasamsi Jirani. Jirani is that when the soul, when the cloth becomes old and worn out, at that time, a person leaves that discards that cloth and goes to another, uh, wears another set of clothes. So similarly, it is said that the soul leaves one body and goes to another body. So death is the most undeniable of the realities of life. Sometimes you may have this question, especially in today's world where everything has been relativized, what is real? What is, is the world real? Is, uh, is can when people behave in, behave properly with us? Are they really good people? Is their good behavior real or does it conceal a bad heart? The government media gives us some messages, some newspaper reports. Are they for real? There's a whole genre of fake news. So, you know, we this question get the question, what is real? And we might gravitate to the idea that nothing is real. But even if we deny everything else, we can't deny the reality of death. So there's some founding realities with which we can rationally build a worldview and that is what we'll be doing over the course of the course of our sessions so what can be rationally understood what can be scripturally understood through revelation and how that can be integrated with our experience so, uh, so, so let's begin with death so death is the most undeniable reality and yet it is the most denied reality And somebody doesn't accept some reality, they said that they are in denial. So, similarly, when we don't accept the reality of death, then we are in denial. Now, what does it mean to not accept the reality of death? If anybody is asked, are you, are you going to die? Another person is insane. Most people will never say, I will not, I will not die. That I am immortal. So, in what sense is anyone denying death? So if we, we accept that we are going to die, but we think of death as something so remote and distant, so abstract, as if it is happening to someone else, and as if it were going to happen to someone else in the distant future. So it's just like if we knew that we were we, we are working on a job and that job, we are going to be fired from that job. I mean, there's going to be retrenchment and we're going to lose that job. Then knowledge has no meaning without, knowledge is not real unless we apply it. If we knew we were going to lose a job, then we would immediately start looking for another job. If we knew that we are going to be, we are going to lose our house, maybe we are rented and the rent period is getting over, then we would start looking for a new house. So if we similarly knew, knew in the sense that it be accepted as real that we are going to die, 
then you start asking, at least ask the question, what is death? Is there anything after death? What really counts in life? So the fact that we, most of us don't seriously ask this question, and certainly we don't ask this question as seriously as say, okay, what will I do if I lose my job? What will I do if I lose my house? So the seriousness of the question is seen by how seriously do we look for alter, look for some alternative arrangement? Now somebody might say that, okay, what happens after death is unknowable, so why bother about it? Well, if we are going to think of it that way, even the future itself is unknowable. When we, if, if we lose our house, what kind of house we are going to get, what kind of economy we are going to, economic condition the country is going to be there, what kind of neighbors we are going to have. We can't predict any of that. So just because we can't predict a thing accurately doesn't mean that we don't think about it or we plan for it. So yes, death is a way. why do we deny death like this? Because it is so scary. At one level, it is so scary and it is so, it seems so unknowable what is going to come after death. And that's why it's important that we see through the eyes of knowledge. That is spiritual knowledge, scriptural knowledge, what is given in the Bhagavad Gita. Now, in a later session, we will be discussing more in detail about the principle of revelation and how knowledge can come to us from a higher source. But let's look at this from a rational perspective. So in the last session, I discussed about how there are empirical pointers towards the existence of the soul, towards something that exists and goes from this life to another life. This body to another body. That's how reincarnation is. That's how people have past life memories. So, if there is something spiritual within us which is indestructible then that brings us to the question okay then what is death so if the spiritual is indestructible then that's not going to die so then what will death mean let's look at this okay i do the screen share here so death is the departure of the soul from the body Basically, there are, we could say our existence has three levels, the body, the mind, and the soul. I'll talk about the mind more in detail in a later, later session. But suffice it to say, at a simple level, that the body is like the hardware, the mind is like the software, and the soul is the user. Now, say we are working on one particular computer. We have a desktop at our workplace. And then we go somewhere else, get traveling, and then we reach there, and then we log into the computer over there. Now, as soon as we log into the computer, then many of our details get linked with that computer. Say we buy a new computer. Once we log in, then our bookmarks and our preferences, they all get get linked with that computer. So similarly, <clears throat> what happens at death is basically we leave one computer. The computer, the physical structure of the computer is the, the hardware that is like the body. And we, the user, are like the soul. So the soul leaves the body. So the hardware is left behind. Now, when we go to a new place, basically what happens? New computer. Now we have certain memory. That is, we know our password and certain details. And then when you log in, then remaining details get linked with that computer. So similarly, when the soul goes from one body to another body, along with the soul, the mind also goes. And the impressions that we have, the desires, the inclinations, the overall inspiration, the overall kind of actions that we have done, they're all impressed in the mind. And then the mind gets, mind is what, helps us interface with that next body. So basically, when the soul departs from one body and goes to the next body, that is death. Now, if you look at reincarnation, now what is reincarnation? So death is basically the departure of the soul from one body to an, from one body. And reincarnation is the entry of that soul into another body. 
And when the soul enters into the next body, what essentially is happening again? Essentially, for the soul, the body is like a tool. So till now, I've talked about uh, two distinct examples for reincarnation. One is like a dress. The second is like a is like a computer. So if we consider it to be like a dress, like a dress, one dress gets worn out, and we wear another dress. So for the soul, the body is like the dress, but the interface between the soul and the body is quite complicated. It is not as simple as simply uh, raising our arms and putting, slipping into some sleeves and putting on a dress, putting on some clothes. The interface between the soul and the body is complicated, and that complicated interface is mediated through what the Bhagavad Gita calls as the mind. So, through the mind, the soul is pulling to the next body. And reincarnation, the word reincarnation literally means karna is flesh, re is, uh, re is again, and asian is, is to come again. So, reincarnation essentially is. And the soul comes back into the next body. Soul comes into a new body to come again in flesh. Now, reincarnation is something which is universal and unavoidable. That means the soul needs some physical interface for functioning in the world. The soul is very different from the body. And just as a human beings, if we are if we go to some environment which is unnatural for us, say if we go underwater, then we need a whole set of diving gears. We need some way which we can respire, we can get oxygen. So we, without that gear, we cannot function in the environment which is alien to us. So if humans go into space, similarly, we need space suits. So for the soul, the bodily and the material environment is actually not natural. It is unnatural and that's why the soul basically needs some physical tool for interfacing with the body, for interfacing with the material world. And that tool is the body. That tool is the material body that we have. Shrotram Chakshin Sparshanam Chakrasanam Ghaname Vacha Adhishtayam Shayam Vishayam Pusevate. So, reincarnation is mentioned here. Krishna talks about it again later in the 15th chapter. From 15, 7 to 15, 11. And there he says, in 15, 8, 9, 10 especially. So, this 15, 9, he says that when the soul gets a new body. Basically, it gets a set of senses. Shrotram Chakshun Sparshanam That means the sense of hearing, the sense of seeing, Sparshanam, the sense of touching, Rasanam Dhanam the sense of tasting and smelling. And these are the ways in which we interact with the outer world. We basically gain knowledge from the outer world and then we function in that outer world. So, reincarnation is something that happens to every single soul. Now, what kind of body the soul gets, that depends. That depends on what? Broadly two factors. So just as if we are having a particular dress, a particular set of clothes and they get torn and then we want to buy new clothes. How do we decide those clothes to be bought? Basically two things. You know, our budget and our liking. So, what we desire and how much we can pay. So, similarly, for the soul, what body it will get in the next life depends on its desires. But not just on its desires. It also depends on the kind of karma that the soul has done. See, our karma, if we do good actions, we get good results. If we do bad actions, we get bad results. We'll talk more about the principle of karma in future. But at this stage, this is going to be a simple understanding that when we do good, we get good. When we get bad, do bad, we do bad, we get bad. And some of the results of our actions come immediately. 
some come gradually so the actions that we do they get accumulated and they comprise our we could say our karmic bank account our karmic assets in the in the karma bank account and depending on what kind of assets we have accumulated what kind of actions we have done during the course of our life we decide it is just we get a particular body so that is reincarnation now the concept of reincarnation so now we are moving to the third question so to sum, so summarize say the body and the soul are here this is a previous life so this is the death means the soul leaves the body and then after that there is another situation or somewhere else at a different place a different time and there the soul enters into the body and when the soul acquires a body that is that is the reincarnation so the departure from here is death the entry over here is reincarnation and the concept of reincarnation has been used quite a few times in today's entertainment industry and it has become romanticized and sensationalized so there have been some researches on the concept of reincarnation done through near death experience and done through hypnotic regression into past lives so brian ways is a prominent researcher in this field and he found that people uh, people often suffer certain traumas or phobias or certain behavioral deficiencies or limitations because they carried over from a previous life say if somebody is irrationally afraid of water they have hydrophobia then maybe you take them through not a regression to previous life and they come to know that oh, that i will say the person is sitting on a some seat and the therapist leads them backwards remember when you were 10 years old remember when you were 5 years old remember when you were 1 remember when you were 6 months remember when you were in your mother's womb what do you remember before that and that way when they are led backward then gradually what happens is that they suddenly say oh i am at this place and they start talking about an entirely different place and they have very vivid expressions very vivid emotions and often they speak things which can be factually also correlated so through hypnotic regression it may be found that this person who has hydrophobia in this life had was had, was drowned in a previous life and that's why they have fear of water so sometimes recollecting the hurts of a previous life can free one from continuing to hurt in this life and if that happens this is helpful so this is so this is also an so the idea that we may have some previous lives that is substantiated by this but current to our topic the such memories of previous lives often are associated with the relationships from previous life and so to some extent the idea of we having unresolved issues in a previous life has also been utilized by the entertainment industry and thus there are men there are movies that come up with people who say a couple who maybe their love was thwarted in a particular life and then they die and then they reincarnate and then they again long for each other and then they meet each other and then such people who meet each other they are called as soulmates so the idea of reincarnation has become highly sensationalized and romanticized that people think that oh i i wish i could i should find my soulmate now we all long for relationships and we all long to love and be loved and we know relationships can be a big gamble because sometimes uh, we may get together with a person who is who who is not what they initially appear to be and then instead of getting joy we can get a lot of pain in that relationship so the the idea of a soulmate actually gels gels fully with our longing for love and now this is 
So often in the spiritual sense, so whenever people hear about reincarnation, they also want to know, okay, do I have a soul? Where can I find a soul? So the first thing first is that you know, when we talk about the soul and about spirituality and reincarnation, the important thing is to focus on the soul, not on the mate. To focus on the soul, not on the mate. That means that first we need to understand ourselves, who I am. And secondarily, we can think about who I should relate with. Because if the focus shifts on just finding a mate, finding a partner, then are we really gaining spiritual knowledge? Are we really appreciating the value of spiritual knowledge? How are we at a functional level different from people who do not know anything about the soul and are still looking for some mate, some partner? someone to love and be loved by. This longing is fine, but this longing, we need to understand that it can sometimes sabotage or take over our spiritual search and spiritual understanding. So first things first means we need to focus on our identity, that I am a soul. And what does it mean when I say I'm a soul? That, as I said, the soul is connected with the body. The soul is related with the body. So unless the, so when we relate with people, say I am a soul here and this is my body here. And somebody else is a soul and this is their body there. So quite often we are attracted to people based on their physical appearance. Of course we can say I'm also attracted by personality traits and that's fine. At the same time, what happens is when we go too much through externals, then we may consider somebody to be our soulmate but we are attracted to them primarily at the physical level. And then that relationship, that infatuation can again blind us not only to our spirituality, but also to their spirituality. Because we simply see them as attractive physical creatures. So this is the first point that the idea of soulmates, it can distract us from our spiritual life if we become infatuated with it. Now having said that, is it that still, is it that we, we are going on a journey of multiple lives and we do have some soulmate? The idea primarily is that the soul is related with the divine. We will talk about the divine more in detail in future sessions. But the Bhagavad Gita says that Mama Imam Shul Jeeva Loke Jeeva Bhuta Sanatana Manashashani Yani Prakriti Sthani Karshati in 15.7, the Bhagavad Gita says that we are all actually speaking, every one of us is a soul who is a part of God. And thus, our eternal relationship is with God. And by having this eternal relationship with God, we also have a relationship with others in this world. So we could say we have a horizontal relationship with the divine, with the whole whose parts we are. And then we have horizontal relationship with others. Now the horizontal relationship that we have with others, they are temporary because they are at the material level. We relate with them at the level of the body and those relationships end. Now we leave this world when we die, or they leave this world when, we die, when, they, when they die. But either way, the relationship that we have with God is eternal. Now, other relationships, in some cases, it can happen that some souls go through one life and they go to another life and they meet again in another life. So the possibility is there. But the probability of that is low. Because there are many, many souls, and uh, each soul has its own karma. Each soul has its own history of the karma in this life, as well as karma, karmic history in the previous life. And when the soul leaves the body and goes, the destination of the soul is often determined by its own karma, and it can be very different from the destination of another soul. So this is not to trivialize the relationships that we have in this world, but it is also we need a reality check so that we don't unnecessarily uh, sensationalize or artificially eternalize those relationships. So 
we could say from the spiritual perspective that our ultimate soulmate is the supreme soul that is god and the purpose of transmigration is spiritual evolution evolution means just like in in biology the idea of evolution is there and that essentially means that as living beings survive in a particular environment they adapt to that environment they become more resilient and they develop more and more features that can help them to function so to evolve means to gradually improve that's the broad idea of evolve now spiritual evolution means that our consciousness becomes more and more spiritual that our consciousness evolves to a, evolves in the spiritual direction so when that happens when our consciousness evolves in the spiritual direction then we go closer and closer to the ultimate spiritual reality that is krishna we'll discuss that later more specifically but the idea is to the extent we are caught in the world in the things of the world in the positions and possessions in the world then to that extent our consciousness stays materially entangled and it doesn't evolve so much but to the extent our consciousness arises beyond the things of this world and connects with the eternal beyond this world then we are evolving spiritually this evolution happens like i started that we deny death so the denial of death is is what stagnates us in our spiritual evolution because if as long as we are denying death we cannot really consider contemplate or pursue anything higher in life so basically spiritual ha- happen uh, spiritual evolution happens by the expansion of our capacity to learn and to love to learn what really matters what counts what really lasts and then to direct our affection our heart our love towards that and so the for the soul the it is inspired in the bhagavad gita that the divine that god resides in our hearts and he goes from one life to another life with us so whether other souls with whom we relate they go from this life or not to another life that is that is unpredictable but what is predictable is the divine within us always goes with us and in that sense the divine this divine is our ultimate soul mate and it is that connection that we should try to pursue so the once we understand the soul the primary focus should be on the soul and then on the mate so if you understand the soul then we'll understand the eternal relationship of the soul is with the divine and developing relationships developing a connection with the ultimate reality is the process of yoga and uh, the way to develop a uh, connection with the ultimate spiritual reality that is bhakti yoga that all this we'll discuss later but at this stage the idea if we begin with the soul and then we focus on the nature of relationships then the idea of a soulmate will inspire us to pursue our spiritual evolution but then what about our relationships in the world yes it is definitely possible that say some people Uh, are more compatible with each other and less pe- other people are less compatible and some people we might just click and if that happens we might feel that this is our soulmate now <clears throat> let's find the important thing is that we focus on our spiritual evolution and <clears throat> even people who are very compatible with each other there are going to be some differences sometimes with other and Uh, maturity means we learn to live with those differences we need to transcend those differences so the idea is if we keep craving at the horizontal level oh where will i find my perfect partner where will i find my perfect partner where will i find my soulmate then our consciousness will get caught in that itself and we won't evolve spiritually but on the other hand if we pursue, if we pursue a spiritual evolution we focus on growing spiritually and understanding ourselves then we gain further clarity about ourselves we we become purer our minds become calmer and then we can understand other people better we can relate with them better and thus whatever relationship we have they can also become a stable possibly even sweeter if we are in, if we know ourselves better 
and if we have become spiritually stable ourselves. So about relationships again, we will discuss more in a future session. But the idea of soulmates is something which we wanted to address here. And one last point, and then we can have, we have planned to keep a lot of time for questions so that we can discuss more. So one last point, I'll talk. The idea of reincarnation, as I said, it has been sensationalized and romanticized. And there's much research uh, or much of what people have in the popular imagination about reincarnation comes from movies or novels or some other, some other area, some other presentations of spirituality where things have been sensationalized. So now this has to be very carefully evaluated that it is not that if just because some things seem similar, sometimes there are some books on the reincarnation which show, okay, this particular famous actor, was there and he was this person in this previous life, or this is this person in this life. There are, which sense, there are books which sensationalize things like that. And now if you just take a face cut of, a cross section of the face cut of people, basically the, uh, not the face with the flesh, but a broad face cut. A large number of people's faces will match. And uh, you cannot really prove an incarnation based on simply the similarity of the faces. So that's a very superficial understanding. And sometimes such, such evidence, such supposed evidence of reincarnation, which does not stand critical scrutiny, that is portrayed in the public media. And when that is refuted, or that is that is challenged, that is debunked, then people think that they are oh, reincarnation is all just focus focus. But reincarnation has been seriously investigated by scientific researchers. And they have uh, come up with significant evidence like what I talked about in the previous sessions about past life memories especially. So now, serious Ian Stevenson is one of the most prominent researchers in this field. And he does not give much credence to hypnotically induced past life memories. See, what I said earlier, somebody had hydrophobia and they remember, and they go back to the previous life through regression and they get, he, they remember they remember or they see in their memory that they drowned. And then that memory that relieves them of that fear of water. So now the health benefits of past life regression are widely documented. But that itself does not prove the reality of, of the previous life. Because it could well be that that person just imagined it. And so just like at the physical level, we can have placebo effect where people think that they're being given some medication while they're just being given sugar pills and they get cured of their disease. So just as there can be placebo at a physical level, there can be placebo at a psychological level also, where somebody might just be imagining that they're remembering especially when somebody is under hypnosis, they're very prone to suggestion. Now, the serious, uh, some of the serious researchers in past life, they won't actually prod too much. They will just guide back, not give specific suggestions. But sometimes some suggestions can be given even at a subliminal level. And so it's very difficult to determine for sure that uh, when, when we recollect something in a hypnotic, during hypnotic regression, is it accurate? So sometimes when people try to go into hypnotic regression to try to find out who they were related with their previous lives and to try to find a soulmate that way. That can be a very counterproductive endeavor because we may just get caught in the imaginings of our mind and think that they are real. So of course, some hypnotic past, hypnotic regression cases can be accurate. So especially, so in my book on reincarnation, demystifying reincarnation, I've talked about cases where people in their past lives have exhibited xenoglossy and xenography. Xenoglossy is the capacity to speak in foreign languages. Xenography is the capacity to write in foreign languages. So there are cases where somebody remembered that they were a Viking warrior uh, in the in the, 15, in the before the 15th century, 11th, 12th centuries, something like that. Or somebody spoke in a tongue that just couldn't be identified. Or some, some, somebody, some, some, sometimes some people wrote in a script 
that this shouldn't be identified. Later it was found that it was actually a language that had existed from the third century to the sixth century and become extinct. And apart from, say, a dozen language specialists, nobody else knew this language. So how did this person who had never even heard of this language in their conscious life, who couldn't recognize what they had written after they were, came out of reincarnation, who, and yet during, after, not after their reincarnation, during their hypnotic regression, but they remembered during that hypnotic regression and they wrote it that way. So this, if they, there is some tangible, verifiable, factual uh, evidence that emerges, then that can point to the reality of the past life memory uh, through regression. Otherwise, it is questionable. So if, some, if regression gives benefits to someone, that is fine. But the benefit itself does not prove the reality of the memory of regression. And similarly, uh, romantic depictions of people who are soulmates meeting each other in a few years in, in, a, in, a, in this life, they might satisfy our heart's longing for love. But that doesn't necessarily guarantee that actually we have met our soulmate. So spiritual search is essentially a search for spiritual evolution. For understanding what is real, for understanding what is eternal, and connecting with that, it is not so much to romanticize the things of this world and the longings that we have for various things in this world. And if we focus on spiritual evolution, then we can have lasting satisfaction. And ultimately, when we connect to the supreme spiritual reality, that is the culmination of our reincarnation. That we will talk in a future session. When I summarize what I spoke, I broadly spoke on three things. What is death? The soul, the mind, and the body are existence of three dimensional. So at death, the soul leaves the body and goes to the next body. It's like we discard an old set of clothes and take a new cloth. But the connection with the soul and the body is more complicated than simply a person and their clothes. So we talk about the interface that is the mind. So it's like the, bo the body is the hardware, hardware, the mind is software, the soul is the user. So when we go to a new computer, then we log in and our previous data comes over there, connects us, uh, gets linked with that computer. So similarly, the body goes to the next life and then the, the mind and its impressions get carried with it and get connected with the next body. So death is the departure of the soul from the body. We often live in denial of death, although death is the most undeniable reality. Because it seems so scary, it seems so disconcerting. And nobody will practically, when, when they are asked directly, they won't even nice death, but they live as if they are not going to die. To take death seriously means to prepare for what is going to come for death. And the most basic preparation is at least inquiry. What is going to come after death? And the Gita offers us some answers. So reincarnation of the soul ends into another, enters into another body. And then I discuss elaborately about the concept of soulmates. And we need to first focus on the soul rather than on the mate. And first understand our identity and then look for some relationship. So in the media, when reincarnation is romanticized and used as a plot, as a plot twister in romantic novels and movies, uh, we get a very trivialized understanding of reincarnation. The, we have two kinds of relationships, the horizontal relationship with others, the vertical relationship with the divine. So the ultimate soulmate for the soul is the divine who goes from this life to next life to each life as the indwelling super soul and with connecting with whom uh, in connecting in love with him is the ultimate purpose of reincarnation so in that sense the divine is our ultimate soulmate and while we are functioning in the world we also have horizontal relationships and it is always better if we have more compatible partners in our relationship, more compatible people around us in our relationships. So it could, it is possible that one soul, that two souls from one life can again relink in a future life. But considering that each soul has its own karma and our future life is determined not just by our desires, but also by our karma. It's like the clothes we buy depend not just on what we like, but also what we can pay for. So Two souls from one life may not have the karma by which they may be linked. They may go to the same place and be linked again in the future life. So that's why it's possible, but it's not probable. And if we focus more on our own spiritual growth, then 
we can have more enough stability and clarity. And then we relate to people not simply based on infatuation or neediness, but on, not on based on physical infatuation or emotional neediness, but based on inner maturity, inner clarity. And then we can find out who we can be compatible with. And with the whoever we are already relating, relating with, we can relate more maturely with them. And sometimes uh, I concluded by we need to have whenever any past life memories are touted, we need to have a little critical attitude. We can't be completely uh, naive about it. So just facial matches do not point to what is for and so from a previous life or the next life. And even if through hypnotic regression, sometimes a soul, somebody is healed of some some fears, say somebody is healed of hydrophobia, that could be a placebo effect that at a psychological level that need not indicate the reality of the memory. So similarly, just because we feel that we can relate strongly with someone, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are our soulmates. So we focus on using our intelligence and with respect to past life memories and there are objective evidential things like say xenoglossia xenography then the memories can be real and similarly we use our intelligence to take our decisions about our relationships and about our life as we evolve spiritually we learn to raise our consciousness from the material toward the spiritual we learn about the spiritual and we learn to love the spiritual and that's how our reincarnation attain ultimately its culmination in a connection, in a reconnection with the divine. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So we have some questions over here. <clears throat> so mind is a subtle body. Doesn't the subtle body elements like mind, intelligence, false ego die? No, the subtler body, subtle body is uh, not so easily destructible. It's not physical. It's not gross physical. See, the, we differentiate between the physical and the material. Physical usually refers to that which is perceivable by the physical senses. So form, shape, smell, all these are physical sense objects. So the physical things are destroyed. But the mind, intelligence and false ego, they are subtle. So they are not destroyed. They go with the soul. So the soul is here. Around the soul is the mind. And the soul along with the mind go to the next body. Uh, these will be these will be not exactly destroyed but dissolved at the time of ultimate liberation and the soul goes out of the material world to the spiritual world at the time of liberation then the mind intelligence and ego they dissolve while the soul is going through the on its journey of transmigration at that and the ultimate journey toward liberation at that time they dissolve but they are not destroyed so okay. how long does is the time between death and reincarnation and if it is okay how long is the time basically uh, the time is variable generally each soul has some its, some of its own karma to process so, so if the soul is in this body and goes to the next body, in between the soul has to stay and how long it has to stay that depends on various factors. Just like say, if we are at one place and we go to another place, sometimes we might, while during the journey, we might take a flight and we might reach in a few hours. Sometimes we might uh, take a car and we might take some more time. Sometimes we might go by food and we might just want to enjoy a trek or whatever, it might take longer time. So that's why the soul can, so how long it will take for the soul to go from one body to another body? Just as our car, as how much we can pay for determines whether we'll take a flight or whether we'll hitchhike. So similarly, the kind of karma the soul has done also, also plays a role in determining how long in determining how long the soul takes to go from one life, one body to another body. So Now, where does the soul go in between? Broadly speaking, the soul can say generally the soul, if it's here in the human body, when it gets the next body, it can if we can get a human body immediately, it can go to a lower body, an animal body, or it can go to a lower level of existence. There are there are there are higher heavenly levels of existence, lower 
hellish levels of existence. The soul can go there. So that if it goes to the lower species or the lower locus, then it may take that transition may take much more time. So where exactly does the soul go? That depends on the karma. And in between states, the soul stays in a disembodied state. Now there are two different cases over here. One is the soul just during the journey. So there is during the journey when the soul leaves, the Garuda Puran explains when the soul leaves this body and gets another body, goes to another body. In between, the soul gets a temporary covering. It's not exactly a body. It's a temporary covering which is gro grosser than the subtle body and subtler than the gross body. And that becomes like the transition, that, that the transition body, you could say. So that is called sometimes the soul with that kind of body is called the preta. Now, bhuta or ghost is different. A ghost is a ghost is when the soul leaves the physical body but does not get a gross body at all. That is, say, uh, when the soul uh, commits suicide. So, somebody was supposed to live in a particular body for 70 years, they commit suicide at the age of 40. Then, by their karma, the next 30 years, they may not get a body and then they have to live in a disembodied state. So disembodied means the soul is there, the mind is there, but the physical body is not there. So that is called as ghostly body. And with that ghostly body, when somebody lives, then that is a state of quite a great distress because the soul has desires which they can't fulfill. They may desire to eat something, but they don't have the physical tongue by which to eat it. And that's why sometimes our souls to fulfill their desires, to fulfill some unfinished, to deal with some unfinished issues, they might try to possess somebody. And that's what is called as possession, the ghost entering into someone. Yeah. Now, normally we, when somebody dies, we say conventionally Swargavasi or Narakwasi or gold or whatever. But that is more of a conventional saying where exactly the person goes, that will vary from person to person. Yeah, I answered this. So, which means now regarding this Bhoga Yoni, I discussed about scientific proof for incarnation in my previous session. Please hear the previous session. You can get it over there. Why do other religions not talk about reincarnation? Not exactly. It's not that they don't talk. In my book on... Uh, this uh, uh, divine reincarnation. I've talked about other religious traditions also. So for, <clears throat> I can't go into all of them. Now Buddhism does accept reincarnation, but because it was a heterodox tradition that emerged from Hinduism as a rebel tradition, it tried to assert its philosophical autonomy. And one way it did that was by rejecting the idea of a soul. So there is soul, and the soul has reincarnation. So this is the understanding of the Bhagavad Gita. If you consider in Buddhism, what it did was it, it refused the soul and it accepted reincarnation. So then the question comes of what actually reincarnates? That's diffi very difficult for Buddhist thinkers to say. And if we look at the original writings of Buddha, he was remarkably non-philosophical. He generally did not address philosophical questions much. So it can be reasonably said that he did not deny the soul, but subsequent Buddhist thinkers rejected the idea of the soul. But reincarnation is accepted by Buddhism. And if we consider that reincarnation requires something to reincarnate, the soul is quite logical. Now, Christianity, on the other hand, accepts the soul, but rejects reincarnation. Now, that also is not explicitly denied by Jesus. If we consider Jesus asked this famous incident when a person was blind, and his, the prophets around him asked, you know, is this person blind because of his own deeds or his parents' deeds? No, actually it was not a person, it was a newborn child, small child was blind. So was, and he was, had been born blind. So was he born blind because of his own deeds or his uh, parents' deeds? So now Jesus uh, did not address that question at a philosophical level at all. And he simply said that Le he is born he was born blind so that the power of grace could be demonstrated. And then 
Jesus uh, performed the miracle and the boy got back his eyes. Now, if you consider, not everybody who is blind gets a miracle performed in their lives and they get their eyes back. So, now what Jesus, if he had categorically been against reincarnation, this would have been an excellent point to reject that. The very fact that his disciples asked the question that is he blind because of his own deeds? Now, what deeds could it be? Unless he had a previous life, now where could he have done any deeds by which he got born blind? What could, was it in the womb? Now, what could he do with, wrong in the womb? Maybe just fold his legs wrong? And is that folding one's legs wrong a serious enough crime to have a to be to invite the punishment of lifelong blindness? Doesn't make any sense. So the query question indicates that the followers considered reincarnation as a possible explanation, not specifically reincarnation. Here it is pre-existence. So reincarnation refers to what happens after this life. Pre-existence is what happens before this life. So they accepted pre-existence, pre and pre-existence also means reincarnation. Uh, in the history of Christianity, somehow, when initially the Christians were persecuted by the uh, Roman emperors, and then the Roman Empire itself was becoming very immoral, and the Roman Empire, Constantine and the Justinian, they saw that the Christians were among the most moral people. So they decided to adopt Christianity as the official religion. But then, uh, they adopted Christianity not because of spiritual purposes, but because of political purposes. Because they wanted to have poli better political administration. And if people are moral, then they are more easily uh, governable. But because he wanted to use Christianity as a tool to consolidate political power and authority, he basically pressured the popes or whatever. And after that, uh, he had the idea give, he, give them one life or give them hell and that way they will live they will live this life morally and morally means his idea was they will obey me they will honor the king there are eminent christian thinkers like origin who have openly talked about reincarnation and saint augustine who is considered the foundational uh, theologian in christianity he has also entertained questions about reincarnation. So there is no categorical denial of reincarnation in the Christian tradition. <clears throat> but somehow it has become historically sidelined. So you can read the De Demystifying Reincarnation book. Uh, one of the devotee scholars, Stephen Rosen, has also written about this uh, reincarnation world tradition. There's a whole book on that topic also. Now, more about horizontal relationships, I'll be talking in my next session. The horizontal relationships are also important. We, uh, the, one of the next future sessions, I'll talk about that. Yes, we'll focus on regarding bad habits. We'll be discussing that in a future session. But um, if something is unexplainable, don't bother about it. Just learn to deal with it as much as we can. The more important than where something comes from is where it is taking us. We need to focus on not why I'm having a particular impression, but how can I deal with it now? And bhakti involves a process of purification when, uh, by which we can deal with it. And in the third chapter, I'll be talking about past bad habits and how to deal with them. We'll come to it eventually. <clears throat> now, as far as performing religious rites for the deceased relatives, that's fine. If that is a part of our family tradition, we can do it. It's a, it's, it's a part of a religious obligation that we may want to follow. But the essence, see, every culture will have its own traditions. And the spiritual principles which are cultural, there are spiritual principles which are transcultural. So we need to primarily focus on the spiritual principles that are transcultural, that is connecting with the divine. And certain spiritual principles that are cultural, yes, if it's our culture, we follow them. If it's not our culture, we don't follow them. That doesn't matter. That is something which can be decided based on individual discretion. We'll talk more about relationships in the future. Uh, again, so I'll keep questions about that. So why are uh, life's punishments so acute? 
uh, let's discuss this more in a future session because we cannot let's stick to the philosophy over here what you discuss in the session is our soulmate already determined by our destiny or based on our consciousness solely pulled towards us <clears throat> see destiny should never be used as a reason for irresponsibility that means we have been given intelligence in this life and we have to use that intelligence to choose wisely to choose responsibly and we use our god given intelligence whenever we are forming any relationship is now what exactly is destined and what is not destined that is quite difficult to say broadly you could say destiny is like weather forecast so weather forecast means that if we are going on a drive it's good to know that oh, it's going to be rainy it's going to be stormy it's going to be uh, it's going to be dark whatever so misty so similarly but it basically destiny gives us some kind of weather forecast about what kind of situation we are going to get in our life and now how well we drive that's up to us that is not determined by destiny and similarly for us what we do uh, how we relate to people that is not determined by destiny so we need to be as responsible as possible in our relations in forming relationships and growing those relationships so is it that our uh, life partners are already determined well uh, much of the romantic literature depicts that and sometimes some some people might quote something from scripture also to support that but the broad idea is that it's not necessary that everything is ordained and that's why it's a uh, it's very difficult to say this so we we rather than thinking that oh, there is some perfect partner out there who we need to find we need to use our intelligence to find the best that we can in our situation is it that if our consciousness is not good then we attract someone who leaves us and with with bad who doesn't stay with us well it's not that simple that our consciousness does affect our decisions and sometimes we may take bad decisions because of that but is it that simply bad consciousness will naturally mean that you will attract a bad person maybe maybe not it depends on context sometimes people may not have any spiritual consciousness but still they may they may have very good relationships at a at a practical functional level at a familial level so we relationships are complex the past life karma is complex and we can't reduce them to over simplified statements of what is to be done and what is not to be done chakras i'll talk about um in a later session where is the soul living while in the transition body the, the, the transition body basically is, is around the soul just like our physical body is around the soul um that's how the soul is around the uh, that's how the transition body is around the soul what, what is the guarantee that we will not reincarnate if we practice devotional service ultimately we have to understand what is the purpose why we are existing in the world god loves us and he doesn't want us to be in the world if by the time of our death our love for god has become greater than our love for the things of this world then there is no reason for god to keep us in this world he will go with us to the next world and that's how if we consider simply from the point of purpose of reincarnation from the purpose of a logical perspective we stay in this world because we desire to enjoy the world if the desire is no longer there then we will leave this world does our love of god go with us yes definitely it's a purva abhyas in the day never riyate ya vishwas or to speak of uh love of god even a broad spiritual inclination also we carry from this life to the next life well liberation does a subtle body dissolve by liberation or going back to godhead well both are essentially the same the ultimate liberation is to go back to godhead and the subtle body dissolves when we go out of this material world and enter into the spiritual sky so thank you very much for your questions and we'll continue in our next session and i'll be sending the topic for the next session shortly basically we'll talking about 
and how do we how do we deal with uh, how do we deal with the loss of a loved one and does spirituality mean suppressing our emotions or sublimating our emotions we will discuss in our next session thank you very much hare krishna